the first part of the 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 Good evening. We're on the air again with another edition of Patients on the News. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, although I can't see you and you can see me, I feel a bond after all of these years with the people who watch this program because they, like me, are interested in the issues of the day. Uh, they're thoughtful. They want to know more. And that's what makes this show go. Uh, curiosity. Uh, trying to probe a little into the issues and what's behind the news. And because we have an hour with each guest, we get an opportunity to, to, to really uh, dig down and talk about these issues in, in a conversation. And I feel as though all of you who watch are part of this conversation. Uh, you are surely very interested people and uh, I think we all believe that there are not enough truly interested people uh, in America. So with that, I want to introduce our guest. He's uh, someone that uh, I've known for a little while. His name is Lance Dutson. He is a uh, political expert, political consultant, uh, well-known uh, Republican, has uh, uh, been part of and run uh, several Republican campaigns. I'm going to ask him to tell us a little bit more about that. But he is also a, a very good thinker, uh, a very rational human being, and uh, uh, he has views different than mine. I am uh, uh, lean a little bit to the left as, as a Democrat. Uh, he is a uh, lifelong Republican, and uh, I'm looking forward to a really good conversation which all of you will be uh, part of. Lance Dutson, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Lance, uh, why don't you tell the folks at home a little bit about your uh, background, how you got to Maine. You told me raking blueberries. Mm -hmm. It's a very good way to get to Maine. <laughs> and, uh, and then from raking blueberries, how it all evolved into a, a bit of a political career. Sure. Well, I first came to Maine uh, about 23 years ago. I had some friends that were... Uh, up here during the summer between uh, college years, raking blueberries, making all kinds of money, so they invited me to come with them. We camped out in a tent in Sedgwick, Maine, and raked blueberries for the month of August. Um, I fell in love with the state. I just thought it was the most beautiful place I'd ever been, and everybody packed up and left at the end of August, and I stayed here. Um, I did a lot of things um, over the years. I worked as a, as a cook in a kitchen, and I uh, started a bookstore at one point in Ellsworth, and um, went to school at night to learn uh, web development and computer programming. Started my own web development business um, some, I don't know, 15 years ago. Um, and then through that business, I became kind of accidentally involved in the political process. I was, um, I started a blog to promote my business where I'd talk about internet marketing and things like that and ended up getting kind of opinionated on the blog and, and rubbing some folks at the state house the wrong way turned into quite a quite a skirmish it was a ended up being um, a very highly charged political debate over the state's marketing program. so what was your just as a matter of background mm -hmm. what was your point of view and what 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 were they upset about so uh, my point of view i had clients that i was doing uh, online marketing for and the state was actually outbidding my clients for promotional uh, advertising space so essentially the state would spend a whole bunch of money to draw internet traffic away from private businesses and then redistribute that internet traffic to other places. So um, it was kind of the early days of blogs and, and kind of on the forefront of that and um, I don't think the, the state and a lot of political figures understood how to handle that kind of criticism. Who was the governor? I was Governor Baldacci mm -hmm. at the time. And um, so I pushed very hard. It was very critical and started doing um, some kind of, I guess, uh, junior investigative journalism about how the state ran its marketing program. 
and this didn't go very go over very well with the, with the folks that were in charge, um, and it ended up being a big court battle. Um, it was kind of a national a national free speech issue um, that I won. And um, after kind of getting a taste of the political process, so you got a lot of national publicity. Yeah, the Boston Globe ended up um, calling out the state, saying that it was, uh, you know, a, a oppression of, of free speech. You know, the political speech is the most sacred thing we have in this in this nation, and that even if I was hyper opinionated or obnoxious in my in my criticism, that it was still something that the state shouldn't be trying to suppress. And I think pretty much everybody agreed with that. And um, so through that process, I learned, first of all, the importance of mass communications sometimes and just surviving as an individual in this country. It's, um, there, are, um, there are times, and I think we can probably get into it later, but I think Speaker Eves would, would agree with, uh, with that, that there are times when government steps over bounds and can interfere with people's private lives. And being able to um, communicate that effectively and advocate for yourself is uh, ended up for me at the time to be kind of a survival technique that I learned. I also realized that the state of Maine is unique in that um, our elected officials are very accessible, and un unlike other maybe more densely populated areas in our country, the um, the idea of participation is um, gets you a lot farther than maybe it would in some place like New York or California or Washington. Uh, Maine needs people to participate in the political process, like you said in your in your opening. And um, I guess I hadn't realized prior to that experience how um, how first of all how important that was, but also how um, how accessible our government is um, to anybody within the state. So I got involved. Um, uh, after that um, skirmish, I stayed involved in politics, paid very close attention to what was happening in the state government, um, dabbled in investigative journalism for a little while. Um, I ended up uh, being able to be part of some really unique things in the budding, I guess what they would call the citizen journalism world. I um, was part of a group of 12 bloggers that were the first uh, first bloggers um, allowed to get court reporting credentials in the federal court system and spent some time during the trial of Scooter Libby um, at the, in the federal court in Washington. Did you really? Yeah, it was a very interesting experience that I and think... Just to re re remind people, Scooter Libby was the chief of staff for Richard Cheney when he was vice president of the United States and uh, you covered that tr I, I trial? I did, yeah. I spent a week down there. We rotated um, through. Uh, we had a, two sets of credentials, so we rotated through. Um, and if I look back at my writing now, I was so wrong about my perspective there. It really taught me that uh, that sometimes when you're in court and you, uh, you fall under the spell of, of skilled attorneys. T tell us what you were wrong about. Well, I was there during the time when, um, uh, when Tim Russert was on the stand. Um, amongst others, and um, and Libby's attorney really just pulled Russert apart, and um, I think really, really skillfully called into question about everything. Well, that, what was the issue? What was to Russert testify? What was the issue? So well, that folks, sure. Well, the issue was um, whether or not uh, Libby was a central player in leaking classified information to the press. About Valerie Plame. That's right. Who he outed as a CIA undercover agent. That's right. And it was a political, it was alleged to be a political move to out her on this. And to discredit her husband. To That's discredit right. her husband, who was the one who had gone to Africa and come back and said that there is no, essentially undermined the story that Saddam Hussein had this plutonium or something. That's right, the, the yellow cake. Or the yellow cake to blow up the world. Right. And Valerie Plame's husband went over, they came back, he said the, this story is not credible. Right. And that undermined Dick Cheney's efforts mm -hmm. to uh, suggest to the world that the United States should invade Iraq. That's right. So there was a trial. So um, the it was a really interesting um, court case because the press was so heavily involved. I mean, the, the facts of the case were about a leak to press. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, the New York Times reporter went to jail to protect her sources on it for a period of time. And um, so the, the scrutiny of the press was fascinating to me because, uh, especially as a Republican, we tend to bristle a little bit about perceived press bias. 
But for the first time that I had witnessed really closely, you had the press being scrutinized by, by the legal system. And it was interesting to watch someone like Tim Russert, who is such a respected journalist, have that um, same kind of light shine back on him. And at the time, sitting there in the courtroom, watching um, this attorney go through Russert's recollection of his involvement in the leak or in uh, accepting information from different sources, the attorney was so good that he, you began to understand that people's memory is not as, uh, as solid a thing as, as most people think. Um, I mean, he, he broke down um, and caused contradictions within Russert's testimony that I think made Russert look terrible. So I walked away from that, and I did, I, again, it's funny to look back at the writing, I was certain that Libby would never be convicted, ever, and uh, based on kind of the small window of things, but that's not exactly how it went. I was, I was pretty wrong in it. But it was a fascinating experience, and it was a very important court case. Um, I think it... Um, he I was think sentenced it, to prison, wasn't he? Yes, and yeah. then, right. Um, and then he was pardoned. He was pardoned, right, or his sentence was commuted, his I think. His sentence was commuted, yeah. Um, but, it, but it was a window into the Washington political press nexus that was fascinating. And, um, you know, we don't have that same level of intensity up here, but all politics is governed more behind the scenes than it is in front of the camera. And being able to get that close a glimpse of it was a great experience. So now that led you to some other political work. Sure. So after, um, uh, in, I guess, 2007, I started working with Senator Susan Collins' re-election campaign as her digital director. Um, and that was kind of the early days of, of online campaigning that's since now become rote. Um, I, I served as her new media director on Capitol Hill for her federal staff for a period of time. And um, I've worked on U.S. Senate campaigns every two years since then for Senator Kelly Ayotte. And then um, I ran uh, Charlie Summers' U.S. Senate campaign against Angus King in 2012. And in 2014, I was communications director uh, for Senator Collins' re-election campaign again. So I, uh, I've worked quite a bit in political communications with a, a real leaning toward the digital part of it. And uh, it's a fascinating field. And Who would you say, it. which campaign, a national campaign, has revolutionized digital campaigning? Would you say that Obama did it about as well as anybody's ever done it? Uh, yes, I think so. I mean, there's a, there, um, the evolution of, of uh, online campaigning is moving so fast, and it's become such an integral part of campaigns now. But Obama's, the, the coordination of Obama's digital piece with the rest of the standard field operations and communications was, was unmatched by yeah. anybody. So, all right, so now what, do you, now what are you doing? So I do political communications consulting for candidates. I do communications consulting for private organizations. Um, I, uh, last time I was here, I guess four years ago, I uh, was the chief executive officer of the Maine Heritage Policy Center. Um, so I like to keep my hands in public policy, focus primarily on Maine. Um, I'm, like a lot of people, kind of addicted to, to campaigns and the competitiveness of those. So that's something that's, that I always like to try to keep my hands in. And, uh, so I, 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 just to remind the folks, Maine Heritage Policy Center is the kind of conservative think tank for Maine. Uh, it's in some ways but uh, uh, like but uh, not really like the Heritage Foundation mm -hmm. in Washington. But at any rate, it is the conservative uh, uh, think organization for the state of Maine. I go to many of their luncheons. Mm -hmm. Not that I agree with much of what they say, but I'm very interested mm -hmm. in what they have to say. And that brings us around to uh, this interview. One of the things that I think uh, the audience for this program is interested in is, and, and I think we have conservatives, liberals, all kinds in our audience, mm. but they all are open-minded to the extent they want to know what makes the other side tick, too. I mean, mm. uh, I, I run into uh, a lot of people who are not like that, uh, both on the left and the right, mm. where uh, they simply say, well, the other people are wrong. They're dead wrong, and I'm 100 percent right, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know how those other people can believe what they believe. And uh, I am fascinated with why people don't believe what I believe mm -hmm. and why they would have a different opinion. I, I play golf at the Portland Country Club 
a lot of conservative people uh, they are politically conservative people and um they just think i'm a dope you know i mean <laughs> how 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 can you believe what you what you, what you believe mm -hmm. they, there is no effort to really understand the other side mm -hmm. so one of the things we try to do in this program is to understand uh, people who have a different uh, opinion. It's a little bit unusual in this mm -hmm. day and age, uh, particularly when so much of the media is this narrowly focused media where people can, you know, go to that media, that medium, and hear exactly what they want to hear, which is you're right and the other people are wrong. Right. So having uh, said that, um, do you see any connection between the Bernie Sanders crowd, the anti-Wall Street rhetoric of the Bernie Sanders crowd, and Tea Party Republicans? Um, you know, I think there is a connection there on a, on a couple different levels. First of all, between Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, this election cycle is fascinating. I don't really agree with either one of them or wouldn't support either one of them, but what they, um, I think, exemplify is this hunger the American electorate has for authenticity in politics. I think people are finally getting to the point where the kind of pre-written soundbite political dialogue is not acceptable anymore. I watched the Democratic debate last night and just the, the delivery um, methods that the Bernie Sanders uses and the, the emphasis and the actual, the fact that you really believe that he believes what he's saying um, is is powerful on its own, regardless of what he's talking about. Um, and I think that the Tea Party movement that started in 2009, 2010, had a little bit of that as well. But I don't know, I, I definitely think there's a nexus between the right and the left, but I think it has more to do with populism necessarily than uh, the kind of constitutionalism that the Tea Party initially was founded on. Um, I think but your populism is the connection between those two groups uh, yes. on the left and the right. Well, po yeah, some people would say populism, some people would say reactionaryism mm. or reactionism. Um, and I think there are good things and bad things about both of those. Um, you know, I, the, w within my party, I think we're at a kind of a crisis right now. Um, sometimes these periods can help distill uh, political groups' vision and help them move forward. Um, right now, I think. Republicans in particular have kind of forgotten what our structured representative republic is all about. And I think that's different from what the Tea Party folks initially, I think, uh, I think the getting back to basics was the idea of the Tea Party, um, a, a very strong um, respect for the Constitution or a constitutional system. I think what we've got right now in the chaos in Congress in particular, and really in the Republican Party in Maine, we see this as well. Um, more of a synthesis of anger um, and uh, than a real political philosophy. And I think that's dangerous. I think it hurts our party. So let's go back to the populism uh, mm -hmm. piece of this. I guess this is my, my view of the connection mm -hmm. between, uh, you know, the Bernie Sanders uh, Occupy Wall Street mm -hmm. uh, point of view and uh, the Tea Party folks. Uh, and that is that they all seem to believe the system is rigged mm -hmm. against the average uh, American, that the middle class has no power, that it, oligarchs have rigged the system, money in politics, mm -hmm. and both the Republican establishment and the Democratic establishment is in the hands of the oligarchs. Mm -hmm. uh, do you sense that there is that connection? I think so. I mean, I think uh, there's some interesting... Um, corollaries there. I mean, the, the conservative argument over o Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, has a lot to do with that too. And you don't hear a lot of it in the news, but really one of the things that bothered folks like me about mm. the Affordable Care Act is that um, not only was it a, a government takeover of a huge portion of our economy, but that the uh, pharmaceutical companies and um, the insurance companies w were so um, supportive of the concept because it created essentially 100% market share 
for them. And that seemed to me a collusion between big business and government. I think it was definitely a collusion in order to get it passed. They, mm -hmm. If the in big insurance companies uh, and drug companies had been opposed to Obamacare, might not have passed. That's correct. And uh, But why would they oppose something that forced everybody to buy the product, yeah. right? But, but uh, let me mm -hmm. probe a little bit on that. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, government uh, takeover. Uh, I'm on Medicare mm -hmm. and have been for a number of years. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very happy to be on Medicare. It works very well and that's a real government takeover mm -hmm. because that is government provided insurance. Obamacare is simply uh, a device to get private insurance to cover mm -hmm. uh, people who couldn't otherwise afford it. So. Medicare is government insurance, government health care, and that's a real takeover. Sure. I mean, that's, that's more of a takeover than Obamacare. Absolutely. Or the Veterans Administration, I think, is another good example Veterans of Administration. That. So um, uh, why aren't the Republicans who are against Obamacare mm -hmm. also trying to get rid of Medicare? Well, I think there's, there's a lot of different reasons. My perspective on it is that I appreciate that Obamacare tries to utilize market forces and not completely take over the private health care system. Unfortunately, there are things like the individual mandate that interfere with regular market-based economics. So I think Republicans know that eventually the bill is going to come up. And, and, and I think that there's a lot of uh, mistrust from Republicans about what the intention of Obamacare was, that, that really it was an effort to move uh, to a single-payer system. I think a lot of the rhetoric at the time would bear that out. And I think there is a kind of conspiratorial thought that the, um, the lack of, um, of market uh, freedom within Obamacare would cause it to collapse to the point where the government would have to step in and take it over. Now that's a whole other argument of whether you know, the United States as a developed nation should join a lot of other nations and provide health care as a... a well, what are the Republicans uh, think? They think that uh, just to let the market, let the free market determine who gets the health insurance and health care. Well, I think so. Or, no, I don't think to that extreme you know, to just completely take hands off it. But I think we see that in different elements of the healthcare market, the more competition, the better the product and the less, um, the less expensive it is. Well, I understand that, and I understand all of those capitalist notions, and mm -hmm. I agree with them. But, I mean, the real question is, um, should people be, should some people be entitled to health care because they can afford it, and other people not be entitled to health care because they can't afford it. Well, absolutely not. And I think um, some of the work that Republicans have done in, in Maine, um, although we've gotten quite a bit of pushback uh, for trying to make these changes, has kept folks that are unable to provide their own insurance in mind. I think there are ways to allow uh, people that can afford it to, uh, to be involved in the free market and folks that can't to be subsidized or taken care of by the government. I well, I, well, well, well I, I can afford it, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm on Medicare, but uh, I know people that can afford it who are not eligible for Medicare, not old enough for Medicare, mm -hmm. and they get their insurance. They, they decide which insurance company to go with. We do that mm -hmm. in my law firm with our group insurance. Mm -hmm. So the government isn't telling my law firm, Freddie Flaherty, who to use for their, golf, mm -hmm. their group insurance. Mm -hmm. So Well, it is to a degree because... Uh, because of the uh, restrictions, particularly in Maine, that our state has put on private insurance carriers. There are more... Uh, uh, Maine, to give you an idea, when Obamacare came out with all these very strict mandates about coverage that Republicans across the country railed against, Maine was already to the left of Obamacare. Actually, our biggest struggle in Maine has been we just want to, we just want to essentially, to make it simple, go back to, toward the right to, to assimilate with Obamacare, we haven't been allowed to. But you know, the real problem, I think, to stay, take a step back from the actual policy and the market dynamics, is that Obamacare was passed with no Republican support. Because, now let me just interrupt mm -hmm. here, because the Republicans said the day after the mm -hmm. president was sworn in, we will do everything possible to make sure he fails. Mm -hmm. We are against everything he's for. And I've, I am always suspicious when you have, you know, 
couple of hundred Republicans in Congress and uh, uh, 40, uh, 43 or 4 Republicans in the Senate. And not a single one, not one, mm -hmm. has a different opinion than the whole mm -hmm. group. I'm a little suspicious. But well, the reverse is true as well. I mean, but 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 my yes, point the reverse is, is true as well. I my, agree with you. My point is not necessarily blame on this from a party dynamic, but my point is that when you pass a piece, I mean, the Civil Rights 1964, the Civil Rights Act, wasn't passed on a party line vote. Right. Totally different. You but, know, but it was a broad sweeping change to society, as Obamacare is. It's an extremely uh, uh, revolutionary change in, yeah. in, in how we deal with health care. But you can't do something that big without doing the work to convince other people that it's the right thing to you do. You couldn't convince them. They're against everything Obama's for. They are, and they mm -hmm. said it. In fact, Mitch McConnell said it. Our job is to make sure he fails. He mm -hmm. said it two or three days after the inauguration. So, look, things have changed. I know sure. a lot about Lyndon Johnson and the Civil sure. Rights Act, and I worked in the mm -hmm. White House in those days. And here is how the situation was totally different. These parties then mm -hmm. were not monolithic. They didn't, every single one of them, subscribe to the same mm -hmm. view on every bill. Right. They simply didn't. In the, in the Democratic Party, you had all these Southern Democrats all opposed to civil rights. Mm -hmm. All we, we, we knew, every, they would vote against the civil rights bill. Mm -hmm. All right? So you had the Southern Democrats monolithic against it. Then you had the northern and midwestern and western Democrats for it. Mm -hmm. Every Democrat outside the South was for those civil rights bills. In the Republican Party, you had no Republicans in the South. You had two, mm -hmm. Strom Thurmond, who had switched, and John Tower mm -hmm. of Texas. Otherwise, there were no Republicans in the South. So they were divided between the... We had a lot of Republican senators and members of Congress in the Northeast. Don't have any anymore, essentially. Mm -hmm. Right. One. Two, we, yeah, two. We had Kelly Ayotte and, Susan, and Collins. Susan Collins. Right. So, but we had a lot of them. And they were moderate. Mm -hmm. They were moderate. You had, you had um, uh, Western and, and uh, uh, you had Western conservative Republicans, some of them, like Barry Goldwater. Mm -hmm. And you had Everett Dirksen, who was in the middle, who was the leader of the Republicans, who did these things because they were right. Mm -hmm. Not what, he, he, it wasn't the politics of it. He was a conservative. Mm -hmm. But the appeal to him was, this is the right thing to do. That doesn't happen in America anymore. Well, you know, I think we're at an interesting moment right now. I'll use the, uh, the Kevin McCarthy uh, speaker situation. And I, and I think it reflects on our experience in Maine as well. What you described with the Southern Democrats, and maybe this is a bad, bad comparison, but they were, that was kind of the end of that block, right? I mean, no, for it wasn't Southern, the end. It wasn't the end. No, I, I, it's, it's, well, for Democrats. It, it was the end of the Democratic Party label for them. Mm -hmm. All they did was to retain the same right. views they had before and switch their party affiliation. Mm -hmm. So right now, what we have in Congress is a uh, kind of a tyranny of a small minority, that there's this group of, of far-right, um, I guess, populist conservatives in the Republican Party that are causing chaos down there. And what I think we're dangerously close to, and I say dangerously kind of with a positive connotation, is that Republicans get tired of it, or mainstream Republicans get tired of it, and start working more closely with Democrats to marginalize them. We have the exact same thing happening in Maine right now. You have the Senate President, Mike Thibodeau, who is probably the most conservative person I know, has, because of the, the governor's intransigence, has started working with Democrats to try to take back control of the state and actually get some things done. And those are, I think, watershed this is a watershed point. I think it's brought on by some real uh, screwy behavior within the Republican Party. But I think there's the possibility now, I'm optimistic, that things such as what you just described in 1964 could happen now. Um, it wasn't the case uh, during the, uh, the Obamacare discussion. I agree with you. Um, but, um, but I think we're at a different point now. I think Republicans, 
tradition, or specifically New England Republicans, who I think used to have kind of a, a real personality of being moderate or moderate in tone, are looking at the fact that Donald Trump is our, our leading presidential candidate right now, and it's terrifying. I mean, Trump doesn't represent Republican values in any way except for what, what I've always fought against is this media bias against Republicans that we're, we're screwballs. And, um, you know, we're entering this point where our party um, ethos is a caricature. And I think this is the point where that starts to change. But, but, but it's a caricature, but it's happening in, uh, in Washington. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, these, this group of Republicans in the House are against everything. I don't know what they're mm-hmm. for. They're against everything. They're, against, they're openly against government. Mm-hmm. They think government is the problem. Right. And when you think government is the problem and somebody says to, me, to you, well, look, you're destroying, you're making it impossible to govern. They say, yes, that's the point. Mm-hmm. We want to make it impossible to govern. Right. We want to destroy the, the, mm-hmm. the uh, uh, efficacy of government. Mm-hmm. That's our point. So it's happening. Um, and I, I, have a, I have an interesting quote from yesterday's Times um, it, 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 about a couple of interesting quotes. One, uh, Phyllis Shafley, is that the way you say it? Phyllis mm-hmm. Shafley, she is the chairwoman of the Conservative Eagle Forum. And of course, she's against Ryan. A lot of these very right-wing organizations are against Ryan. And she says, the kingmakers are so desperate for someone to carry their liberal priorities (laughs) that they are trying to force Congressman Paul Ryan into a job he does not want. Now, here's a lady, uh, a representative of a conservative organization, Mm -hmm. who says... That Paul Ryan is a liberal. Why, why, why do they want to have a liberal? Mm-hmm. Now, most people who would evaluate Paul Ryan's positions on mm-hmm. on issues, the last thing they would say is he's a liberal. Right. So what's going on with this lady? What, and and people like her. Well, you know, there's there's a lot of dynamics. One of them, I think, and I think what what she comes out of is this um, entertainment complex on the right that talk radio is kind of at the center of, and. You know, you always have to understand people's motivations when you when you hear their words, and it's a lot easier to raise money and to gain audience when you're out on the edge or when you're over the top. It's not a good way to run government. And I think, you know, I think strangely, even though it was kind of pre-modern media, our founders knew that. I mean, that's why we have this this system set up, particularly with the United States Senate, where we have a house that's you know, going to be more prone to populist uprisings, and we have the Senate that's supposed to be the cooling off chamber. Um, that's, re- that's really important because I think we'd flip back and forth all the time on whatever the latest. It's, you you mentioned was. something interesting about, uh, you know, the, the media and, 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 uh, and talk radio mm-hmm. and all of that, getting people all wound up. This piece in the Times about mm-hmm. Ryan mm-hmm. Uh, says, but House Republicans and their staff say millions of Republican primary voters have their opinions shaped by sites like Breitbart.com, which define a version of the conservative position of the moment and then whip their readers into a frenzy. Mm-hmm. And that's what you're saying. Absolutely. I mean, I, from working in, in, uh, in a federal office, it, you really come to, to learn this, and I'm sure your experience has been the same way. We would have uh, Glenn Beck or somebody like that bring up a topic on the air, and all of a sudden the phones would start lighting up. And for two hours, we'd have people calling up completely angry for some random thing or another. And it's, you know, it's uh, predictable, and it's, it's unfortunate. I think uh, conservative talk radio in the beginning was a very good thing. I mean, it brought people to a level of awareness of what's going on in the federal government that wasn't there before. Um, but it's it's out of control right now, and it's I think it's very damaging because I think now you have political figures that play to that audience that could be um, that essentially is seated in thought by one person trying to gain ratings or make money, and I just I think that's a bad thing. You mentioned something earlier that I wanted to come back to, and that was kind of these silos that have been created in what kind of media people digest, and talk radio does the same thing. You know, politics is the art of addition, not subtraction. And I, I think 
I can speak to Republicans, that we're at a point where we're, it looks to the rest of the world like we're not trying to bring anybody else into our party, that we're happy with who we are and we're being exclusionary. In Maine, it's, uh, it's particularly acute because we have a governor that's won re-election or won election twice in Maine without a majority of voters. So, you know, uh, when you try to do good things in government and when a society tries to move itself forward, it can't do it without some level of consensus. And within our party now, we've, we have a breakdown in that. We have this idea that we're going to go on this kind of purity purge uh, to make sure people are true conservatives. When conservatives are saying that Paul Ryan is a liberal, I mean, that, that's just, it's delusional. It's delusional. But it, it fits um, the purposes of the folks that are spreading that message. And that those purposes are not to make American society better. They're to either gain money or ratings or something like that. So it's important that people push back against that. The problem is with moderates, this is the biggest problem in American politics now. Moderates are moderate. They don't grab their pitchforks and run out in the streets and try to make social change. They prefer to avoid, avoid the argument. Um, they have other considerations, their work and so forth. Um, so it's a, it's a dilemma, but I think, um, but I think it's got to change if, we're, if our, our system's going to get better. And the people who have a lot of money and want to exploit the system as much as they can mm -hmm. don't like government either. Mm -hmm. They don't want government. They don't want government regulations. They don't want to pay taxes, very much in taxes. Mm -hmm. So they co-opt these folks and these, these visions of mm -hmm. uh, conservatives often. It helps them. They like, they like it. It, but it has nothing to do with, uh, it has to do with themselves. They don't want to pay taxes. They don't want to have regulations. Well, may, perhaps from the right, but there's a, an awful lot of money on the other side as well coming into it. From where? From, well, Maine's a perfect example. I mean, we've had one gentleman that's very wealthy that's essentially funded the Democratic but Party he's for not, But he years. didn't do it to reduce his taxes. No. Nope. He, didn't, he didn't do it to reduce regulations on his hedge fund. Mm -hmm. uh, he is contributing to the party who is making, he th what most people think, making life more difficult for the capitalists. Well, perhaps, but, um, you know. Why I, is that? Uh, well, I think he's got a political belief, and I think that, you know, he wants to engage in the process, and he, like me, believes that spending money in political races is akin to free speech, and it's his prerogative to do it if he wants to. Same thing on both sides of the aisle, yeah. though. I mean, the middle class can't spend anything on free speech in political races. Well, they can spend as much as they want to. No, they can't spend as much as they want to because they don't have any money. Well, I, I suppose that's a valid point. But the, the, problem, the breakdown for me on, polit on campaign finance is who's the arbiter of, of when you regulate. If I buy a piece of poster board and a magic marker at the CVS and spend $7 and write a sign and that says, Harold Page is for president, is that political spending that should be regulated? No. So at what, what point does the expenditure become something that, that gets regulated? Well, I think most people that I know answer that question by saying full disclosure. All mm -hmm. we want to know is if you're a guy who is like Mr. Adelson out in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. his, is he, what he's interested in is Israel and mm -hmm. making sure that the United States is in lockstep with Israel on right. foreign affairs issues. So he's willing to spend $100 million of his business to make sure that he gets a presidential candidate who says what he wants him to say. Mm -hmm. So I think if as long as you know that he's behind it, it's mm -hmm. fine. The problem is we don't know who's behind a lot of this money. Mm -hmm. We just simply don't know. And it's disclosure. And the fact of the matter is that we can't get the Republicans in Congress to vote for a bill that provides a window in transparency into this? I, I don't, I, well, first of all, I agree with you completely. My, my philosophy on campaign finance is give what you want, full disclosure. Mitch McConnell has signaled that he would be open to the same type of thing. The issue they is... They voted against, the, uh, there, there was a disclosure bill. Yeah, but not straight disclosure. Not that's, straight disclosure. That's the issue. So, so you know, 527s, PACs, C4s, all these different organisms, super PACs, they grew because of campaign finance regulation, not because we don't have enough. Every, money's going to find its way into politics. Oh, I mean, how they, many years they, have you been doing they, this? Lance, wait a minute. But 
uh, what a lot of this grew from is the Supreme Court saying you can't regulate it. Sure. And, it, and people said, okay, now we have a way to give a lot of money. If I'm very rich and I want to give $10 million to a candidate, mm -hmm. then I can and nobody's, and I can hide it and nobody will know where it comes from. The hiding part is the part where I think there would be consensus. Why if do you think that people give oligarchs, very mm -hmm. wealthy people, give away a lot of money uh, to politicians? Why do you think the Koch brothers spend mm -hmm. a lot on politics. I think the Koch brothers, and I'm sure the same is for George Soros or any of, any of the, the left-wing folks, I think they feel that they've done very well, that they're privileged to have the resources that they do, they care about their country, and they believe a certain set of things needs to happen to make their country better. I think that's the motivation from both sides of the aisle. They want their views to prevail. That's right. That's what it is. And mm -hmm. so they have enormous influence because money is influence. Sure. And why do you think that, do you, do you think that they give the money uh, and that the people they give it to say to them, I don't give a damn what you think. No. Nope. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I think. I could care less what you think. Mm -hmm. No, they don't. Right. They know it works. Mm -hmm. They know money in politics. Now I'm on my soapbox. Mm -hmm. Sure. But I've Oop. been at this a long time. Mm -hmm. And Big givers, political givers, know money works. Mm -hmm. They get their way. And that's why we're going back to the populace in both parties, mm -hmm. in both parties. They sense that the system is rigged. Those people who are opposed to Paul Ryan, they think that what happens is that Paul Ryan and the, some of those Republicans in the Congress have bought into the system that... Mm -hmm. is a rigged system. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to blow it up, they say. Well, yes. But I think more accurately, um, you know, if you produced a television show and ratings were your 100% concern, you sold advertising, you watch trends and you try to be on the front of the trend so people are interested in what you're looking at. If you're a political activist that um, has a certain perspective and you see that the world is changing or the nation's opinion is changing, I think the folks that want to survive in the forefront of that realm will change their their approach as well. And I think, you know, Rush Limbaugh is a great example. Rush Limbaugh is as, um, as much a part of the Republican establishment as any human being in America for 25 years or however long he's been on the air. He's railing against the establishment now on his radio show. I mean, he, this is a man that could pick up the phone and talk to presidents. Yeah. And, um, and is extremely wealthy by any measure, but it's fashionable to... And wealthy because he made money doing this, doing what he does. Sure, and he's very good at it. He created a medium. I mean, he's revolutionary. One of the most impactful people in American political history, I'd, I'd say. But now he's, he's the anti-establishment, you know, uh, 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 railer, and it's ludicrous, but it's, it's entertainment. And I think, that's, I think that's one of the motivations behind a lot of the rhetoric, certainly the Shafley stuff that's going on now against Paul Ryan. I think it's indicative of a lack of really solid moral foundation, or I shouldn't say moral, ideological foundation, um, and it's problematic. I mean, Donald Trump is the perfect reflection of where uh, conservative politics are in America right now. He's, he's a, uh, an ideologically inconsistent showman. And, you know, I think we always... I don't think he has an ideology. No, I don't think so either. And he's correct about a lot of things. Like, he would agree with you, I think, on the campaign finance issue. I yeah, think he he's been one of the... I mean, I think he's saying it straight. When he writes a check to a candidate, he expects access. Yeah, right. It's always been the case. I think, though, it's important on campaign finance to, to understand the futility of these different campaign finance regimes that we put up. I don't know what... To, I don't think there's a solution to keep money out of politics. Well, I don't... I don't either, and I want to mm -hmm. get to that in, in a minute. But back to, 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 to what, the, I'm intrigued by these talk show people's Rush mm -hmm. Limbaugh. It, who, who we got? We got Limbaugh. We Glenn got Beck. Beck yeah. uh, Sean Hannity. Sean Hannity. Mm -hmm. um, and they have enormous influence. Mm -hmm. I know people that only watch Fox, only watch, right. them, only listen to Rush Limbaugh, mm -hmm. only. So they have enormous influence. Now. 
Who was the radio talk show host that, uh, on the left with the Democrats? Good question. <laughs> Very good question. <laughs> yeah, I've been wanting to ask that question to somebody on this show uh -huh. for a long time. No one, you're not yeah. it alone, no one can answer that question. Sure. So uh, I say to myself, why is it that almost all of them, the, the, the big ones, uh -huh. are way on the right? And then I say, because you got the government to attack. And people, angry people, there are a lot of people angry at the government, sure. and think they're left out, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so they're tapping into anger. And you'll, you'll listen to, if you're angry, you'll listen to Russia Limbaugh. Mm -hmm. He'll satisfy your anger. Well, it depends what you're angry at, yes. But sure. If you're angry at the government. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I don't really know the reason, but I mm -hmm. search around, and that's one of my theories. Yeah, I don't know. I guess there's other more than... angry Republicans than there are Democrats. Angry? Maybe I don't know. I mean, look at the Occupy Wall Street movement. Yes, look at Bernie that's what, Sanders. That's what. That's why I say Bernie mm -hmm. Sanders, Occupy Wall Street, and Tea Party. There is a connection. Mm -hmm. There is a connection. I had there's a guy who died a, uh, uh, about a year ago mm -hmm. who claimed to kind of be the founder of the Tea Party movement in Maine. Mm -hmm. uh, I forgot his name. He went to Colby. He's a very good guy. I had him on this show. Uh, this is several years ago. Mm -hmm. And and I listened to him. And uh, and it was at the time of the Occupy Wall Street. I said, why aren't you over here in Lincoln Park? You're just like the folks in Lincoln Park. You're mm -hmm. angry at the same people. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was, among others, angry at Wall Street. Mm -hmm. So let's go to Re reg regulation and reducing taxes. Mm -hmm. The Republicans uh, have uh, an economic uh, development, economic progress theory. Mm -hmm. Pretty simple. Reduce taxes and reduce regulations and the economy will take off and all these people that say that their income hasn't gone up in mm -hmm. 25 years, the middle class, they're all going to do extremely well. Mm -hmm. All you have to, simple reduce taxes, and reduce regulations. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? I do, yes, uh, to a degree. I think that there's a, a certain baseline level of government um, oversight that needs to happen with everything um, to make sure things don't get out of control. I think we've got plenty of examples of government not being regulated enough and having problems. But I also think uh, for a lot of parts of the economy, we're overregulated. I mean, look, we, we live in a capitalist free market system. And there's certain math that has to happen for that system to work right. And too much regulation inhibits the good parts of a market system. Um, and healthcare is a great example of that. So I, I think that government's role is to make sure that people aren't harmed and that the, um, that the, the freedoms and liberties that a, that a capitalist system are supposed to allow um, are as uninhibited as possible. Um, but that's it. So now we're in this nebulous area mm -hmm. of uninhibited as possible. Yeah, you need some regulations, but we never get to which ones we need mm -hmm. and which ones we don't need. Mm -hmm. Do we have, should we regulate um, uh, the pollution levels in our water? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Should we regulate what goes up into the air? Sure. Well, see, so again, it depends. I mean, in, in, regulation doesn't always have to be the motivator for doing the right things. I mean, we've seen particularly in the environmental movement that I would argue that the that we've come a long way. Oh, that we're going to argue it. We have come a long way. And I think that government regulation has had a role in that, but I actually think it's more of a cultural shift that has driven that. I mean, the, the products uh, products in the free market considered it an advantage to term themselves green or or ecologically friendly. But and that is a more powerful force in government regulation. So I think there's, I think there, it's not a simple answer to any of those questions. Well, but here's what happens. Here we never get to the, mm -hmm. which regulations are good and which regulations sh should be eliminated. And we never know the answer to that. Sure. Uh, so when I hear people saying reduce taxes, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, to what level? Yeah, well, that's a good to, question. To it's, a, it's always a balance. And I think I don't think you can ever answer that question in a finite way. I think each individual thing has to be assessed 
um, on its own merits at the time, given the political climate at the time and the economic climate. But we have re we have done it. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have. I mean, we've run this experiment of reducing taxes. We had Ronald Reagan told us we we're going to reduce mm -hmm. the taxes. We did reduce the taxes, and the economy is going to take off. Mm -hmm. And so we know what happened. We you you like numbers? Mm -hmm. Look at the numbers. We had George W. Bush to reduce taxes, and the economy is going mm -hmm. to take off. So it's not quite that simple because we have evidence of those things occurring. And I'm not saying there's a causal connection between right. reducing taxes and the crash that we experienced sure. on Wall Street when George Bush was president. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is there's some evidence that it didn't bring us great that just reducing taxes didn't result automatically in prosperity. Sure. Well, I think people, conservative economists, would say the opposite of what you said. And I think there's, there's at least enough evidence to make an argument about it based on the Laffer curve and things like that. But I also think it's deeper than, um, than just the economics of it. I, I think that conservatives believe that every dollar that the government spends is a little bit less autonomy that an individual has. Meaning that is true. It is true, and so I that, agree that, with that. But that's really the argument: is at what point, what, how much of our individual liberty do we sacrifice in order to have a safe and structured society? And then now, now, you've perfectly said mm -hmm. a safe and structured society. So you believe, as a uh, relatively conservative Republican, mm -hmm. that we should have a safe and structured society. Absolutely. So the problem now is where we go on the spectrum. Sure. Uh, I've said this before in this show, uh, a quote from Pablo Casals that uh, I've never forgotten. Mm -hmm. I was watching public television 35 years ago, and I've never forgotten this. It was on public television a show about public Pablo Casals. He was conducting a youth symphony camp. Mm -hmm in Puerto Rico and Casal, they, were, they were playing and Casals banged his baton and he said no 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 you must understand good music is like good government freedom but with order mm -hmm. so we the problem we have I think in our society is we're all afraid to say where we think sure. that needles should be on the spectrum between total freedom and order. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we never get to. Yeah, and that's the argument. That's where the argument should be taking place. And it doesn't have to be such a divisive argument either. Um, I, it does I, not. I, I don't think most people uh, understand that continuum, though. I think that individual battles are so easy to market and get people fired up about. That, um, and there's this very simple extrapolation, you know, good and bad. I mean, in every story, uh, every movie, every uh, you know, epic poem ever written in, in Western society, there, there are heroes and villains. It's how our brains work. And I think people a long time ago realized that if you create villains in politics, you give people a reason to support you. So what about this guy that, 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 that we heard a lot about in the last two or three weeks uh, on a drug? bought a drug company uh -huh, sure. in our capitalist system. Mm -hmm. I bought a drug company, and he said, geez, a lot of people are dependent on this particular drug that we manufacture. So it's now sold for, what I forget what it was, $35 mm -hmm. a pill. And he says, so we're going to jack up the price to $750 a mm -hmm. pill. And people were on it because they would die without it, had no choice but to try to find a huge amount of money to pay for it. Right. Should government do anything about that? Well, you know, that's a tough question. He's... It's changing. He, he faced such an enormous social backlash that that will have an impact on what happens at the end of the day with that drug price. I think that, yes, that's a ridiculous situation. I mean, people's lives are being put in jeopardy because of that. Yeah. And I think that there is a role for government making sure that that doesn't happen. But I also think that there's going to be consideration for allowing society to correct it itself yeah. without sacrificing more of that freedom. So here's what I would say to you when I, you're very capable of responding. I've never run into a 
Republican candidate for office mm -hmm. who was able to answer the question when I asked it, which environmental regulation you think should be eliminated? Always afraid. I mean, you're not a candidate. Sure. But, oh, they're always afraid to, to answer that. Mm -hmm. I might, you know, I might, uh, my answer might get me in trouble with some people. So right. the, the problem is specifics. Mm -hmm. It's like, you, do you, uh, were you here when I had Charlie Summers on? No. Uh, right, Charlie Summers, I said, well, you know, he says, it's the deficit, it's the deficit. Mm -hmm. So I went through this thing of the deficit because the biggest, the biggest growth, single growth in deficit in any presidential administration was Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. Not that he wanted to grow the deficit, right. but the problem was we, he reduced the revenues substantially, but never mm -hmm. reduced because he had a Democratic Congress, sure. never reduce the expenditures. Right. Expenditures went up, revenues went down. But I said, I said to Charlie, which ones were down? Well, he didn't want to, he wanted to increase military spending, he didn't want to get rid of Medicare, didn't want to get rid of Social Security, didn't mm -hmm. want to get rid of aged education. I finally went all through. <laughs> what do you want to get rid of? Right. Never get to an answer. Mm -hmm. That's what I think is right. Look, I, I talk too much. I want to hear <laughs> well, the environmental you. regulations, uh, one is very tricky because, um, you know, nobody wants to see the world around them polluted. Um, you know, in Maine, it's, it's, it's more true does, than just about But it's regulation. Else. It is absolutely regulation. But I think we so live in a democratic regulation. system where the regulation that we create is a result of what people want in general. So, you know, as a, as a free market proponent, um, you know, I, I think that it's important to keep pressure on government and on really the, the electorate to consider the implications in other areas that regulations create. I agree with that. Create. I agree with that, but again, and I'm going to, I want you to tell all your 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 clients, your Republican mm -hmm. clients, that any of them come on this show, I'm going to ask them what regulations they prop would propose yeah. if they were the king to eliminate. Sure. Well, it's going to be different every time, too. I mean, that's the uh, yeah. that's the long and short of it. I think it's uh, having a strong grasp on the balance and the um, you know the philosophy is very important as I, guiding principles. I, I, I do think if we overregulate. Yeah. But I have a hard time pointing to which ones I would eliminate. Sure. So anyway, we, you were very nice to come on the show. Well, thanks for having I me on I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. You are a very good uh, representative of your clients. You are a very smart guy. You are a very articulate guy. I'm going to give you every compliment I can because <laughs> I think you do a very good job. Well, thank you. It's and, all going on my resume now. Yeah, it's all going on your <laughs> on your resume. You can get a video of this interview, and you can use it to promote your business. All right. <laughs> so uh, thanks very much for coming. Well, thanks for having me. It's great talking to you.